Hello everybody. In this video we're going to begin our discussion on the quantum mechanical model of the atom by first going over a few things about light. And you may be asking yourself, well what does light have to do with the quantum mechanical model of the atom? Good question. Well before the development of quantum mechanics, light was thought to behave entirely different from subatomic particles such as electrons. But as quantum mechanics became better understood, it turned out that light and electrons actually have a lot in common mainly what we call the wave-particle duality, where certain properties of light can best be described of thinking it as a wave, and other properties can best be described of thinking of light as a particle, and the same turns out to be true of electrons. So before we go over the quantum mechanical model of the atom in great detail, we should definitely understand a few things about light. So in this video specifically, we're going to talk about how light behaves as a wave, and later on we're going to talk about how light also behaves as a particle. So light is what we call electromagnetic radiation. So what the heck is electromagnetic radiation? Well, this is a diagram of electromagnetic radiation right here. What you have are these two oscillating, mutually perpendicular fields. One of them is a magnetic field and one of them is an electric field. And in a vacuum, these oscillating, mutually perpendicular electric and magnetic fields propagate through space at a speed of 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which is really, really fast. Fast enough to travel around the entire world in one-seventh of a second. So before we go any further into how light behaves as a wave, let's discuss some general properties of waves. Now most of this is probably going to be a review, either from a math class or one of your previous science classes, uh, but I think it's still worthwhile to discuss some of these general properties, again, before we go any further. So the very top part of a wave, that's what we call a crest of the wave. Uh, the very bottom part of the wave, that's often referred to as a trough. And the vertical height of a wave from the baseline to the crest, or alternatively, from the, the depth from a baseline to the trough, that's what we call the amplitude of the wave. Now the amplitude of the wave is going to determine the intensity or the brightness of the light. Another property of waves is what we call the wavelength, which is the distance between two adjacent crests or two adjacent troughs. And wavelength has the symbol lambda. So that weird looking symbol, that's a Greek symbol, that's a lambda. And both wavelength and amplitude are going to be measured in units of distance. So meters, centimeters, nanometers, uh, just the appropriate unit of length. Now there's another property of waves that isn't shown because this is just a snapshot of a wave. Uh, the other property that I'm thinking of cannot be shown in a wave that is at rest. It has to be shown in a wave that is moving. And that's called the frequency of the wave. Now the symbol for frequency, it looks a lot like a V. It's actually a Greek letter. This is called a nu. So it's a Greek nu. Okay? And the frequency of a wave is the amount of wave cycles or the amount of crests that pass by a fixed point in a given amount of time. And usually the unit for frequency is what we call cycles per second. Now cycles is dimensionless. Cycles does not have a unit of measurement associated with it. So oftentimes you'll see cycles per second uh, denoted as seconds to the minus one or inverse seconds. Also you might see this uh, reported as HZ which stands for Hertz where one Hertz is one cycle per second. And the wavelength of a wave is going to be inversely proportional to its frequency, meaning as wavelength goes up, frequency goes down. Which, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, because if you're stretching a wave out and you're increasing that wavelength, then it's going to take longer for the crest of that wave, two adjacent crests, to pass by a fixed point. So that's going to be result in a lower frequency when you increase that wavelength. And wavelength and frequency are going to be related by this equation, where we have nu equals c over lambda. So the nu, again, that's the frequency. The lambda, that's the wavelength. And this letter c is the speed of light, which is always constant. So no matter what type of light it is, it's always going to be traveling at the same speed, which in a vacuum is, again, 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So because we can convert so easily between wavelength and frequency, Wavelength and frequency are just two ways of expressing the same information. Now, for visible light, the light that we can see with our eyes, wavelength determines the color of the light. Now, if we take a look at white light, this is the sort of light that is produced by the sun or from a light bulb. White light actually contains an entire spectrum of wavelengths, and so it contains an entire spectrum 
of colors. And we can visualize these colors by passing white light through a device called a prism. So we pass this white light through a prism and we arrive at a spectrum of colors ranging all the way from red to violet. Now the red end of the visible spectrum of light is going to be a wavelength of uh, 750 nanometers. That's the longest wavelength of visible light. And then for violet light, that's the lowest wavelength light. Uh, that's going to be about 380 nanometers. Okay, so just that limited range of wavelengths is all that we can see with our naked eyes. And so the presence and variety of these wavelengths is what's going to determine what color an object is. For instance, let's say we're looking at an apple, a red delicious apple. The reason why that apple appears red is because it is reflecting red light while absorbing nearly every other wavelength, every other color of the spectrum, making it appear red to our eyes. And so now I'd like to go over a very common type of problem that you're likely to encounter if you're studying this kind of thing. So the problem says to calculate the wavelength in nanometers of light that has a frequency of 8.32 times 10 to the 14 inverse seconds. So again, we're going to use that wave equation, that nu equals c over lambda. Lambda, the wavelength, is what we're trying to solve for. So if we multiply both sides of this equation by lambda, we're going to get lambda nu is equal to c. And finally, we can divide both sides of this equation by nu to get lambda equals c over nu. And so we simply plug in uh, the information here. So c, that's the speed of light. That's going to be 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And then uh, nu, that's given, the frequency, is 8.32 times 10 to the 14 inverse seconds. We can see here that inverse seconds are going to cancel out, and our wavelength is going to be reported in meters. So we're going to get 3.61 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. We're almost there, but not quite, because the problem asks to calculate the wavelength in nanometers. So we have our 3.61 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Uh, we can convert that into nanometers by using this relationship where we have one nanometer is equal to 10 to the negative 9 meters. The 10 to the negative 9 meters goes on the bottom, the one nanometer goes on top of our conversion factor. The meters are going to cancel out and so the answer in nanometers is going to be 361 nanometers. So that's again that's a very common problem that you're likely to encounter and in the next video we're going to talk about the entire electromagnetic spectrum. We're going to talk about all the wavelengths and frequencies of light, most of which are, we're not able to see with our naked eyes. So I hope you stay tuned for that, and I hope you have a great day. Goodbye.